Thank you, Lord Griffiths. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, you are eavesdropping on a radio show. Um, we sometimes do this, and it normally works out very well indeed. Uh, but indulge us a little bit, because it's got the format of a radio show, like my earpiece coming out. Um, uh, what it is, it's going to be a, an hour-long debate on the BBC World Service going out on, I think, the 15th and 16th of this month. Um, but the, uh, the format is that uh, we have two newsies on uh, the World Service, one on the hour and one half, a little summary at half past the hour. And the one and a half hours we're going to record now has to be condensed into that format. So we're going to start off with a panel debate here with the four people behind me. And then at the halfway stage, when we've thrown open the... Uh, the ideas we're going to talk about uh, to the panel. We then throw them after the, the halfway headlines to uh, the audience. Uh, we've selected or we've got interesting questions from a few people. And then I hope there'll be time to go to hand raisers in the audience as a whole, wait for the microphone to come to you, say who you are, and, uh, and uh, uh, then inject your uh, agreement or disagreement into the debate. And we'll start when I get this thing in my ear. And um, <laughs> that's about all I have to tell you. Uh, we hope to illuminate the subject, which is uh, what should I do, what should you do uh, with the rest of my life, with the rest of your life, in the context, of course, of this lingering obsession we had this year with entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur <laughs> being an entrepreneur. <laughs> now, just see whether we can start yet. And what do they say to me? Yes or no? Come on. We can't start yet. Why can't we start? All oh, right. I'm going to have this thing fixed for me. So it's all up to me to start. I mean, it's all up to me to resolve the starting. Here's Rod. Applause for Rod, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is whatever you need to do. Just been stung by a mosquito, so I need a plaster on my ear. <laughs> it's a very ugly medium radio. <laughs> Fortunately. Okay, right, okay. I think we're ready to start when Rod gets back. He's the one who's recording. He's the engineer here. Then we have uh, Julie, who's producing in the gallery, and uh, Richard, who's somewhere here, kind of orchestrating things on the floor. Oh, he's at the back at the moment. We can't see, of course. Uh, Lord Griffiths, for years, has done this staring at the audience with his hands, which I always much admire. But you do need to do it when you're here, because we're ready to go. We'll start in uh, five seconds, then. First of all, I'm introducing things, and St. Gallen, St. Gallen, and then we get on with the uh, panel bit of the show. Hello, welcome to this BBC debate, Whose Business Is It? I'm Peter Day, and for the next, and for the next hour, we're going to be thinking about one really big decision. What should I do with the rest of my life? Or maybe, what should you do? What job to choose, what career to follow, what calling to open myself up to? This is a question of interest to millions of people all over the world in all sorts of societies. Young people leaving school, children encountering the internet for the first time on a cheap laptop computer, students streaming out of the world's universities, village children with a growing knowledge of the great big world, now reachable but still far away. It's a question of, it's a question of interest when the credit crunch crisis has overturned many of the old seeming uncertainties. It's a question of particular interest to members of our audience here at the St. Gallen Symposium in Switzerland, bright young people gathered from all over the world. We'll be hearing from them as we ask the question, what's my future? But first, a summary of the world news. Then we have a summary of the world news, which we can't... <laughs> 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 which we're not going to record because it might go out of date with this election in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> and then we come back to the programme proper, which will happen now. 
Hello, welcome to the BBC debate from Switzerland. As they say here, Gruetzi Mittenand, greetings. And today we've got quite a large question to discuss. No less a theme than, what should I do with the rest of my life? In other words, I'm young, I'm ambitious, I want to make a difference in the world, but how? Do I join a big company? Do I sign up with a big international not-for-profit organization? Do I start my own business? Or do I join the ranks of the new breed of social entrepreneurs looking for holes in the current social or political marketplace in just the same way that startup businesses are created to fill a gap in the business marketplace? And how are my choices being influenced by the way the reputation of business and much else may have been tarnished by the recent crises of banks and big industries crumbling and state-sponsored bailouts and the bursting of, the great, of a great, and the bursting of a great capitalist bubble. These are actually questions that apply to alert-minded people of all ages everywhere, but we've got a panel here to lay out some of the issues and an audience of very clever young people from all over the world who I hope will join in the debate later on. Before I introduce the debaters, let me explain where we are and why. We're at the top of a little hill overlooking the city of St. Gallen, tucked into a corner of northeastern Switzerland. Austria is just over there, and Germany is across the Bodensee to the north, and looming on the horizon is the often cloud-bedecked mountain that dominates this quarter of Switzerland called Sentis. And this auditorium, tucked elegantly into a green hillside, like so many buildings here, is part of the University of St. Gallen. Now we're here to mark an anniversary. This is the fourth, this is the fortieth year of what is now known as this. Now we're here to mark an anniversary. This is the fortieth year of what is now known as the St. Gallen Symposium, when distinguished leaders from international business, politics, and the world of ideas gather together with a group of students assembled from all over the world for a very intense two or three days every May. And the point of the St. Gallen Symposium is that it's entirely organized by the current St. Gallen students themselves, a unique occasion. It started 40 years ago, just after the student riots of 1968 in Paris, with parts of Europe in the throes of what looked like revolution, Swiss students decided to show things were different here. It was an immediate success, and in the past four decades, the symposium has grown and grown, so that people now think of it as a student version of the snowy annual World Economic Forum in Davos. And now to the global debate, which of course reflects the theme of this year's symposium, Entrepreneurs, Agents of Change. To address the question, we've got a big company businessman with an entrepreneurial twist, a fascinating social entrepreneur, a diplomat turned academic, and a, skeptical think, think, and a skeptical think tanker. And I'll uh, introduce them as they speak. The question is this, to make an impact, what should I do with my life? Big business, new business startup, or this newfangled thing, social entrepreneur? Or politics, teaching, policy making, peacemaking, maybe even influencing people through the media. Yeah. Well, first of, all, we'll, <laughs> first of all, we'll hear from the speakers, then throw the idea around among ourselves. And after the headlines for the news break, we'll open the discussion to this youthful audience as well. And maybe some of the old is here. <laughs> it is your world. What do you want to make of it? First speaker up is Gautam Thapar, who's head of the third generation family owned Avantha Group in India. It's based in New Delhi. It employs 20,000 people, 10 countries. And though the company is, has quite a lot of different and though the company has quite a lot of different interests, its main activities are India's largest paper-making group, BILT, B-I-L-T, and the country's biggest power equipment manufacturers, Crompton Greaves. Gautam Thapa is third-generation family, but he didn't expect to be involved in the business. He was studying in New York when he was called home by an uncle to wade in and rescue a bit of the group, and... Eventually, the group was divided up. He renamed his company Avantha in 2007. He's got a sharp perspective on what we're talking about here today, not just from the big business point of view either. How do I decide what to do with my life, the choice of where to go, and what career to follow? Gautam Thapa. Thank you, Peter. 
Uh, you know, Albert Einstein was uh, once heard to have remarked that he preferred imagination to knowledge simply because if you had the imagination, you would find the knowledge to make it a reality. And I think in the business world, you see more and more of that. Uh, you know, as the World Trade Organization has lowered barriers to entry and open new markets, the only place where you can make your imagination, or in my case, I could make my imagination a reality, pull in the resources I needed to make it a reality, go across boundaries to make things happen, have absolutely measurable and tangible results, and put on top of it a social conscience was the corporate sector. Uh, to me, that is the place where if you like big challenges, if you like to work with people from around the world, people the best and the brightest that you can find anywhere in the world today, you can only do it in the corporate sector. The corporate sector is the only place which does not today, is not today confined by national boundaries. Government is, social sector is, the corporate sector is not. So if you have that big idea, if you have that big imagination, increasingly the corporate sector is where you will find that knowledge to make it a reality. Thank you, Gautam Thapa. Now to a social entrepreneur with a fascinating idea, introducing the developing world idea of micro-lending to the rich world. Faisal Rahman was born in London to Bangladeshi parents after experience at the World Bank and the huge micro-lending organization in Bangladesh, Grameen Bank. He turned his attention back to the not-so-rich world in London. Five years ago, he started a social business based in London called Fair Finance, starting with a small group of mainly immigrant women on public housing estates in East London. Fair Finance has been making micro loans to kickstart micro enterprises on the principle that customers de deserve a fair deal and profit should be reinvested for the benefit of customers. Faisal Rahman is now 34. Tell us, Faisal, how you worked out what to do with your life as a social entrepreneur and how other people should go about taking that decision. Maybe not as social entrepreneurs, but uh, you might think it's a good idea if they did. Okay, thank you, Vita. Um, I think the way I look at the world is that if you look at the increasing number of challenges that all of us face, individually, collectively, as a community, or on the planet, we see all the challenges in front of us as being around well-being, integration of societies, chronic unemployment, habitat loss, species extinction, increasing inequality, poverty, increasing carbon dioxide, climate change, food and water scarcity. The rate of change is so fast and so quick, it's nothing like we've ever seen before, and it's all happening at the same time. If you were to graph them, it would look like that infamous hockey stick of everything subtending to the same place. What's clear is that our <coughs> existing paradigms just don't work. The public sector has shown itself to be bureaucratic and inefficient, structurally unable to take on the complexities of these issues and challenges. The private sector has shown that it has failed in the sense of imagination in developing new and sustainable forms of progress and development that benefit everybody. And into this space, they seem to have lost the idea of innovation. <coughs> Fortunately, a new breed of entrepreneurs, enterprises and businesses are trying to blur that boundary, as was discussed earlier today and has been referenced just earlier in organisations like the Grameen Bank which has changed the way people look at how poor people are considered risky or non-risky. This is a group of people who've really taken those challenges and seen them as, en as opportunities. Opportunities to create income, opportunities to create sustainable change, and opportunities to make the world a better place. What sets them apart is that they look at the world in sense of redefining what the relationship should be between business, community, and society. They've forged ahead with ideas of sustainability for the business model, and in the broadest sense, accountability in a much wider sense than just finance, and are more and more concerned with the impact and the outcomes of what they do. I think this is revolutionizing the way that we look at business, and I think that if you want to be part of that revolution, you should join that sector very quickly. Thank you, Faisal. Now let's hear from someone with a very different perspective on the future. Professor Kishore Mabubani served for more than 30 years in the Singapore Foreign Service, including two periods as UN ambassador, when he was also president of the UN Security Council. Six years ago, he was appointed dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. He's written three books rather relevant to the My Future debate. The first, 
whilst can Asians think, then came beyond the age of innocence, rebuilding trust between America and the world, and then two years ago he wrote The New Asian Hemisphere, the irresistible shift of global power to the East. So, Professor Mahbubani, your perspective on the personal choices involved in selecting the future. I think to decide what you have to do, you have to understand the times that we are living in. And we are going through enormous change of a kind we have never seen before in history. All the conventional wisdoms are dying. The Reagan-Thatcher revolution is dying. Western capitalism is in crisis. If this was the 1990s, you should go out there and become an internet millionaire, make a lot of money, do good for the society, and you've saved the world. Today, if you don't get your government right, you get a crisis in Greece, you get this tremendous social and political upheaval in America, all this because Ronald Reagan once famously said, government is not the solution. He said, government is the problem. He was right, but we went too far. We dismantled government in the West, and you created this phenomenal crisis today where it's hard to rebuild a social contract on which capitalism rests. And this is where, surprisingly, for many years, the West used to lecture Asia on what to do. And now, surprisingly, Asia is getting it right in the balance between government and the private sector. And this is why the largest poverty reduction effort in human history has been carried out in the last 30 years by a government, the Chinese government, that took the number of people living on less than $100 a day from 800 million to 200 million 600 million people were rescued from poverty. How? Good governance. And therefore, if you're looking for a future that will fix the world and make the world a better place, consider how you deliver good governance to societies around the world. Thank you, Professor Mahbubani. Now, speaker from the panel, Shane <coughs> Frith. He's co-founder of a London-based think tank called Progressive Vision. He's originally from New Zealand. He's only been in London a little bit. He is, I think, skeptical of many of the assumptions we may be making in this debate. Sean, Shane, how do I decide what to do with my life? Yeah. I'm certainly not going to uh, tell you what you should choose, uh, but uh, Professor Mabu Barnaby has uh, stolen my opening line. I, I was going to quote Ronald Reagan from 30 years ago, wh where he said, government is the problem. Uh, but that's actually more true now than it ever was. Uh, over the last 10 years, we've seen a vast growth in government, both in the United Kingdom or in Greece. The problem with Greece at the moment is government debt and a lack of an entrepreneurial sector. So I'm certainly going to argue that I believe you should be looking for a choice in the private sector. But what part of the private sector is up to you? I, and I believe that social entrepre entrepreneurship is an important part of the private sector. I think government has crowded out the traditional uh, voluntary uh, charity sector that has existed in the past in Western societies. Uh, but I, I also want you to choose your career path based on what you want to do. And don't, be, don't feel that you've got a duty to, to go and serve your community in, in, a, in a charitable sector. Do what you find is going to make your life uh, worthwhile and something that you are going to look back on uh, with pride. I, I remember some time ago uh, watching an interview with the founder of EasyJet, and he was announcing the launch of a new charity. And he said, I felt it's time that I gave something back to the community. And I thought, what an absurd statement. Here's a man who started an airline <coughs> that employs thousands of people, that doesn't just benefit those thousands, it also benefits the millions of his customers. 
and moreover, it also benefits the millions of customers of other airlines that have had to lower prices and improve standards to compete with EasyJet. Uh, you, by going into business, you can make a very important difference and, and don't be ashamed of going out there to make a profit. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> this is the BBC debate from St. Gallen University in northeast Switzerland on the BBC World Service. I'm Peter Day discussing the subject of how to choose what to devote your life to. Big business, small business, socially influential intervention, government what? Um, what do you all make of what each other said? Uh, you're sticking to your guns? Are you suddenly, um, have you been converted, Faisal, to the idea of big business or uh, uh, going into powerful government to change the mess that business, uh, in many cases, has made of the world? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, the problems are complex, sophisticated, and require imagination and innovation. And nothing I've heard so far tells me that Innovation and sophistication comes from either the government or from big business. In many cases, both have caused problems. Both have resulted in further environmental degradation. Both have resulted in further inequality. And both have resulted in further problems in society. None are actually dedicated specifically to try and find innovative, sustainable ways of using new ideas to challenge those problems. So I think at the moment I would say no. I still think we need to think of a new way of challenging this issue. We need to look at new people to bring in to challenge this issue. And we need to look at new financing methods and ideas and concepts of what finance and money really means to really address some of these problems. Now, of course, you've had a little experience in great big business because you worked for a time, a little time, in the city of London before you. And he set up an operation um, in East London which looks out at the city of London, the topless towers of the city of London, and then... Uh, deals with people who are completely blanked by the lending institutions, which are only a mile and a half away. So this is very dramatic. Um, but you're so small, aren't you? You're pitifully small compared with the size of the problems that may be addressable by government, uh, by big business. Mm. Uh, isn't that a really big inhibition? It makes you feel good about what you do, but in fact you don't get a lot done. Mm. And I th <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> And although we may be small, the impact and the ripples are much bigger than a small organization on its own would have. One of the biggest challenges with anything is how do you drive change? And I think there's probably two ways in terms of making change happen. One is you can do something so fantastically innovative and system changing that people copy it. People copy it, they take it onto government, they transpose bits of it, they take it onto business, and you start changing the very nature and the very fabric of the way the system works. The other is that you're so fantastically successful that you just get bigger and bigger and bigger and you change the system, the system yourself. We may be small, but our rate of growth is 1,000%. It's still pretty fast. You can do that when you're small. 1,000% is... 1,000% <laughs> of nothing is still nothing, actually, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now, you're not, that, you're not nothing, but, I mean, you can grow fast when you're really small. Mm. Uh, I just wonder how, whether you preserve unto yourself the virtue of doing something different, but the impact you make is really pretty, pretty minimal on the outside world. And that's one of the considerations we must have when we're considering what do I do with my life? How much impact can I make on the outside world? And I think traditional, traditionally when you've looked at trying to change societies, you've thought about working in charities which have had a smaller, more unsustainable approach to just managing what they do and what they do well. I think what social business has done and social enterprise has shown that you need much, much bigger ambitions. Small is not necessarily beautiful. And although we start from a small base, and most social enterprises start from a small base, there are social enterprises in other parts of the world that have changed systems. The Grameen Bank has over, a, I think it's 12 million customers and spawned a revolution, uh, servicing microfinance to 100 million people around the planet. Divine Chocolate in the United Kingdom has led fair trade chocolate and has changed one of the major chocolate brands to be fair trade. Cadbury's is now fully fair traded. Jamie Oliver has shown how you can create innovative, sustainable business models to bring long-term unemployed, disaffected youth groups into high-order, high-class restaurants. So they are changing, and people are beginning to take on some of these ideas. They're taking them on in big industries where they want to change out the way the industry works. They want to be more innovative in accessing new people, and they want to find new ways of accessing and developing products and services that really the rest of us aren't. I mean, if we think about what are the growth areas that are going to be really important in the next few years, 
They're going to be around climate change. They're going to be around health, care, and education in the developed world. These are all areas that social businesses are innovating and growing in. Gautam Tapa, you're a sort of accidental big businessman, but also an accidental entrepreneur, because you came into your family <coughs> company, invited in to do kind of entrepreneurial restructuring, and now you've changed it in a fairly wholesale way, though the core remains sort of recognizable. Um, but you're still putting forward the idea that big business is the change maker, is the thing that employs people and gets things done, essentially. Is that the argument? Oh, you know, if you look at the growth of the social sector, it has usually happened where government has been ineffective in doing its own job. Whether it's the Grameen Bank, whether there are social sector organizations in India, or even currently in the United Kingdom, as banking has moved up, it has just been unable to sustain the cost of reaching out to the, lower, to the, lowest, to the lowest level of, of, of society. Uh, there was a professor who just passed away, unfortunately, C.K. Prahlad, who actually put out a debate about the wealth at the bottom of the pyramid. The but three that, billion new consumers absolutely, in the world. All right. But who is going to be able to service those consumers? It will still come out of the innovation that comes really out of the corporate sector, out of the resources. And uh, Ratan Tata, through the nano, uh, Mr. Godrich, through his uh, 2,000 rupee refrigerator, refrigerator. Mr. Tata, again, through a very simple device that costs 500 rupees to purify water, which then takes care of 80% of the health problems that happen in Indian villages, mainly caused by dysentery. And, and, and stuff like that. So if you look at where the innovation really actually comes from uh, and the ability to scale it up and to really impact society at large, especially in poorer countries, I think it still will come out of the corporate world. There are an awful lot of big companies in the world, though, who stepping into them is you feel a kind of prison wall going around you, that your, your own individuality, your own personal entrepreneurism, the things you do at weekends are hung on a coat peg when you go in, and you have to become corporate man. And all that energy that uh, um, the social entrepreneurs and the startups uh, uh, do is, is kind of driven out by the big corporation. It's very <coughs> difficult to keep anything like Faisal Rahman's spirit or the many entrepreneurs who are in the audience spirit going in a, a company as large as yours or even larger. You're a 20th century organization, aren't you? And the 21st century is about lithe, nippy, something else entirely. Yeah, and I think that is, uh, that is the challenge for the corporate sector because, you know, one of the prerequisites to being an entrepreneur is to, have, is to fail, all right? I think that one of the prerequisites to being successful is failure. And unfortunately, in the corporate world today, and, uh, and this may be go against what I say, when we recruit, we don't ask about failure. I have never seen a CV in front of my desk in the last 15 years where anybody has ever talked about what he's failed at. <laughs> and I think that's the question I ask. I said, well, this is wonderful, but it's as good, you know, you've been to St. Stephen's College, you went to Wharton or Harvard, uh, you, you've done two years of this and four years of that and six years of this, uh, but you never failed in anything you've done. So when the first time failure comes in front of you, what are you going to do? Because you have been straight jacketed for the last 10, 15 years and thinking in a certain way that success comes out of this career path uh, and you lose. So the innovation gets lost in the way we structure ourselves corporately. And I think there, maybe I, I have a divide in, in this case, or I straddle a divide where we have large family ownership represented by my family. We have uh, publicly listed companies, so we have outside shareholders, and where I can always continue to drive the message of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. And we typically pick people out at the age of 30 and l let them run a small business or division and let them fail. Uh, you know, we don't care. That cost of failure is a lot cheaper to me and society than when he does it, when he's the CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation which fails around the world. <laughs> The first piece of advice emerges here for the audience here of very young people going out into the world is fail. <laughs> <laughs> very clear indeed. Now that's also interesting from the Singapore point of view because when I uh, interviewed the senior minister and I think he's now mentor or senior mentor now, Lee Kuan Yew, the creator of Singapore a few years ago, he was embarked on a little sort of uh, stir-up effort to get Singaporeans to, to do failure, to look failure in the face as a good thing, as a creative thing, uh, as we've just heard. Um, but government finds failure jolly difficult, doesn't it, Professor Mabubani? 
But just imagine the consequences when governments fail. I mean, I'll give you a live example today. The biggest political entrepreneur in the world is President Barack Obama. He's undertaking a major effort to restructure American society, to restructure the world order, to fix nu nuclear proliferation. Look at the stakes involved if someone like President Obama fails. And then you begin to understand that no matter how good social enterprise is, and I'm a great admirer of social enterprises, and I also believe that the role of government is to enable capitalists to succeed. I also believe in all that. But the foundation of all of that in any society, I keep returning to this, is good governance. Let me just mention, Peter, take the top three global problems we face today. Number one, climate change. Who can fix climate change? Who can reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Only governments can. And to give you one example, okay? You can become as a big surprise to you that the leader of green technology today in the world, the country <laughs> producing solar panels, wind turbines, and everything else, is China. And why? Because the Chinese government gives incentives to industries to produce green technology, and then you produce the technology to save the world. Take the financial crisis, okay? Just, you know, you've been observing what's the Greek implosion is going on. Just imagine if President Obama fails and the deficits in America run out of control. And suddenly one day the world decides, hey, is it safe to buy the US dollar? Just imagine a world where governments all around the world stop buying the US dollars. And what's happening in Greece is a small picnic compared to what you will see when governments fail in that dimension. So on every major global challenge that we face today, if governments fail, the costs to the world are phenomenal. And that's why we have to get government right. I want to tease that apart a bit, though, yeah. because mm. look, that, there's that solar explosion in China that's going on. Mm. Is government encouragement, this is state-directed capitalism, mm. all right, but who's doing it? Who's building the factories? Who's making the solar stuff? Who's doing the inventing of this stuff? It's companies. It's private individuals, yeah. private companies, a great uh, uh, entrepreneurial drive coming through in China now after lots of foreign direct investment. So there's an interpretive thing. There's a role for government, but the thing, the action point, is actually when it becomes um, the corporation, isn't it? Same with um, uh, Obama, same with climate change, very possibly. I know erupting new tiny startup companies who want to do very creative, apparently seeming things about climate change, enabled by carbon trading, which puts a price on efforts to diminish carbon emissions. Uh, a fantastic mechanism. Yes, the role for government is regulation, is, is a carbon market, the emergence of one, a, per, uh, a better one than we have at the moment, which is rather imperfect. But there's a role for both of these, and the opportunity for an individual to make a mark seems to me still wise government is important, but the real opportunity point for people here is the, the business side of things. Small or large, I don't know. I completely agree with you. And I think the mistake we are making is to make it a choice, government or business. And the answer is, you need both. You need and you need, both, and, and, but what am I going to do with my life? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you want to do, if you want, if what you want to do with your life, let's say you're a young American, and you decided that I am really worried about climate change. I'm going to go out and, in a sense, set up industries 
that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If you want to set up an industry, right, market pricing is very important. The price in the market has got to be right. And even Tom Friedman says, right, in his columns, if you keep the price of oil or gasoline so cheap in America, what is it? One half, one quarter, what you pay for in Europe? What incentive is there in the marketplace for you to go out and do something alternative? Because the price of oil is kept so cheap by government fiat. But if the government increases, right? If the government just taxes one dollar a gallon tax, right, on the consumption of gasoline, it opens the markets phenomenally for alternative technologies. And that's why you, if, you, if you don't get your government right, business suffers. If you get your government right, business thrives. One last question for you for the moment. Don't you think that Singapore is such a special case with mm. the way government works in Singapore, the mm. way society is, the way mm. politics is, that you don't have a lot of examples out of Singapore for the rest of the world? I, by the way, I completely agree with you. Singapore is too small to be an example for anybody. But I would say look very carefully. And by the way, the interesting case here, incidentally, is that in Asia, the two most successful large societies are today China and India. And what's interesting is that both are succeeding despite the fact that their forms of government are almost the exact opposite. And therefore, the lesson here is that there is no one stereotypical answer for good governance. You can have good governance on the Chinese model, you can have good governance on the Indian model, and you can have good governance on the Swiss model or other, other models. But it is not the case that you can take one cookie cutter form of government, which used to be the Reagan-Thatcher model, and tell the world, hey, follow the advice of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and you will succeed. Now the world has become much too complex for that. Shane Frith, you equivocated horribly. You said <laughs> it's up to you to choose what you do with your life. I'm not having cliches like that <laughs> spouted on an occasion like this. Are you secretly <laughs> saying set up a think tank? Oh, <laughs> absolutely not. Which is what he does, of course. <laughs> I don't want the competition. Uh, I mean, you've heard these, these no, very different yeah, views no. of uh, what the important things in life are. Um, come out, stop yeah. sitting on the fence, man. Well, my personal preference is actually small business startup entre entrepreneurship. I've, you know, I, I've dabbled in it in the past myself. In the height of the, the giddy dot com era, I actually set up a, uh, a small dot com. I'm glad to keep my shirt. Uh, um, yes, working in a, in a small entrepreneurial startup, despite the risks of failure, I find personally very enjoyable and a great challenge. But the debate we've had here about big business, social entrepreneurship, or small business is a, is a false argument. We actually need all of them, all three. Uh, a solution to, uh, you know, a cure for cancer is more likely to come from a, a multi-billion dollar uh, pharmaceutical giant than it is from a small entrepreneurial startup. It but might. You say that, but, but Big Pharma is actually not producing the stream of drugs to do these yep. big cures. That was expected from the big pharma structures. So I don't think that's a very good yeah, example, but, but actually. The, the wonderful thing about the free market is, is that there is true competition, and if a small startup has a cure, they can com come to market and produce and sell the product. If, if I find a wonderful new way to produce paper, I can uh, s set up a small company and go and compete with a giant Indian paper manufacturing firm. The, the, the choice is there. The market has these, uh, these tensions that help decide what is the most effective way to do it. If you look at the history of the last 10 years, what company is Microsoft, the giant Microsoft? Who are they most worried about today? Google. Where was Google 10 years ago? They were in a garage in California run by two or three people. Um, you know, in, in an unregulated free market environment, you will have the opportunities for a big business to, su to succeed or a small startup to succeed. You know, we've talked a bit about uh, the success of China and India in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Well, 
It's no coincidence that in China specifically, it occurred when they dropped their socialist uh, mentality that they'd pursued up until the 1980s, and they adopted a fairly aggressive form of free market capitalism, and it's seen 600 million people lifted out of poverty. Yes, government was involved, but it was when government got out of the way. It was when government stopped banning private enterprise, when it banned private ownership of, of, of shares and, and it banned profit. Government getting out of the way, and, and similarly in India, the, some of the free market reforms enacted uh, by President Singh when he was the finance minister has allowed these companies to succeed and to grow. Yes, government's got a role. That role is to get out of the way because it is government that has held back these companies and these, these societies in the past. Well, that's what the panel in this global business debate thinks here at the... No, I shouldn't have said that, sorry. Well, that's what the panel in this BBC debate thinks here at the San Gallen Symposium. That was a necessary announcement. Now I go on to another <laughs> necessary announcement, and then we get to the, the middle of the programme. We'll be back at the San Gallen Symposium in a few minutes to widen this BBC debate on how the best and the brightest young people in our audience and around the world will decide on their futures. Will you make more of a difference in business as an entrepreneur or trying to change the world and earn a living in some entirely different field? Big questions, but before that, a short summary of the world news. And then we get the world news again, and it's, it's, the results are still coming in, I think. <laughs> um, now, I just want to make sure... Right. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I'm going to come to you first after we, uh, uh, we come back to this. Are we ready to come back? Because I can't hear her so clearly what the producer is saying. We're ready to come back, she says. She says yes, actually. Welcome back to the BBC debate taking place in the student-organised and run St. Gallen Symposium in northeast, Swit in northeast Switzerland. The subject is a young person's one. What do I do with my life? Business? entrepreneurship or what? We've heard from our panelists, now let's move the debate into the audience. Some of them are academics and business people of an ordinary sort of age, but many are students from all over the world, people who will have to make the decision we're talking about in this debate. Many people here have been selected as leaders of tomorrow, and many of them are students who took part in a big international essay competition on this subject of the symposium this year, entrepreneurship. I have to disclose I am one of the judges. The best entries get invited, and the very best get prizes and acclaim. And this year's winner is Aina. This year's winner is Aina Begim, uh, studying anthropology now at Yale University. She's originally from Russia and Kazakhstan. She's doing research on post-socialist financial markets, and she's had her own experience of that when she worked on Wall Street, and uh, it was a nasty experience, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it was um, definitely a life-changing experience, something that I've learned a lot from. Uh, I definitely. want to know about that. You changed your life because the company went under. Well, um, <laughs> actually what happened was um, I came in into finance. Coming, I come from a family of academics, so finance is something that I really didn't know much about. And, um, but I was given an opportunity, I was offered a job, at Lehman Brothers, and I took it, and I had a great experience. I've heard of them, Lehman Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and actually we got bought out, so I joined Barclays when we got bought out. But throughout the whole time, I felt like I was an anthropologist within Lehman Brothers because I would pay attention to things, the way people act, the way how the banking culture itself has traditions and rituals and, and really funny ones too. Um, you know, it's, there is a definitely um, an irrationality to the rationality. So, um, so they, of course, uh, going through the breakup uh, of the Lehman Brothers was uh, very tough experience because I've known personally so many people. Um, but I guess it also gave me perspective. But even before then, I knew that I would, that I would be an academic eventually. So, um, so it's made that's you, where I am now. It's, it's enhanced your detachment, the experience you went through, has it? Detachment from what? From you were in the business <laughs> world, you had this awful experience, you say, ah, oh, yes, I'm really an academic, I really want to study this rather than be part of it, do you? Actually, this, no. this is another cop-out, you know. <laughs> no, no, I think it was a little more complicated than that. Um, 
even now, I mean, there are definitely moments where I think uh, being in businesses. I mean, now more than ever, it's such an exciting time to be in business. So um, I think, um, and in fact, I think you can be both. You can do academics and be in business, like um, you know, some of us are here. But the Lehman experience, right. wasn't that a wholesale discrediting and what's happened on Wall Street since of that kind of capitalism? Wasn't it a big no-no to everybody else in the room? Don't touch this sort of uh, Wall Street or City of London or Shanghai or whatever it is with a barge pole. This is really unpleasant world. If I want to do good things in the world, don't go into the corporate finance world. Isn't that what it said to you? That did, I mean, that's not the message I got, but I think that's the message that many people received. I think I, maybe because, and as an anthropologist, I tend to think, I try to think um, in more complex ways. So the way that I... <laughs> 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 I'm afraid I'm rather simple-minded. <laughs> <laughs> I beg to differ. But in terms of advice to people, there's a, lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of very bright people. You're not telling everybody to go into academic life. Um, what? Not at all, not at all. I think everyone has to find his or her own path. And um, in fact, I think it's great. I mean, bef I, I, did, I worked in finance, then I worked in actually for a human rights organization, and now I'm in academia. I think it's all, I mean, you can do one or however many, you know, jobs. And I think it's just, it's a matter of finding where you can be most productive to society, where you can find yourself, where you can make the best and the most important impact. But what luck if you have the chance to try out all these different things. This famous Absolutely. portfolio career concentrated into about five years for you. Amazingly lucky, aren't you? <laughs> Thanks. I, 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 I do realize it. <laughs> and now you're here, so you can cross-fertilize like nobody's business. <laughs> okay, next one. Where do I go next? Yes, you are. My name is Joyce Meng, and I'm a student at Oxford University which I, yes, have some knowledge of myself. Um, <laughs> are you another person who's saying to everybody, become an academic, because then you can see clearly what's going on in the whole world? No, unfortunately. Uh, my background's a little bit different. I started two social enterprises in college. I started Youth Bank, which is a micro-business incubator. That was where? In Lagos, Nigeria. And um, Givology, an online giving marketplace for education. And as much as I really enjoy these experiences and really think social entrepreneurship can transform a lot of different communities, I'm actually going to be working for Goldman Sachs next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told to say nothing about that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but there is a justification, I do think. And I think like there's three important things. The one thing is like the learning aspect of it. Like A lot of these big institutions have really incredible training programs that help you develop a lot of skills. And second one's the network. Like my dream job is I really want to work for the IFC of the World Bank, but it's really tough to get in if you don't have that private sector experience, that credibility. You want to be an international bureaucrat. You have the world at your feet and you want to work for the World Bank. Isn't that terribly 1970s? <laughs> <laughs> I think the World Bank has transformed itself though over time, especially like if you're in the IFC and the private sector arm. The thing is that, you know, government, there's a failure of governance in the world. And frankly, like, you know, institutions are failing, corruption is endemic in so many different countries. And developing a private sector sometimes can't come independent from, you know, building private sector development through like the IFC and things like that. And social entrepreneurship, you touched upon it, it's like small scale, sometimes you need to mobilize billions. Isn't it pathetically small scale, though, often, that uh, you get a great buzz out of doing something, but really you're touching very few lives. And if you, the social entrepreneur, step away from the project, it collapses because it's so animated by an individual. Isn't that a real downside to this wonderful, buzzy thing? That's true, but I think that's why it's so important to build a network and really train leadership below you so that the organization becomes a lot more. That's why they say, like, you know, an NGO versus my NGO. It's not like that. An organization can only succeed if it's more than just one person, one personality. Like at Givology, we have a network of 90 global volunteers. It's 100% student run. And it's very decentralized, like training people to take on space and to, you know, contribute micro philanthropy. Let's have a man. Where do we go to now? <laughs> yeah. Have you got a mic? Mike is coming slower than... 
Good morning. Good morning. It'll be ever so fast when we get it edited. All right. Uh, my name is Martin Erik. Um, originally from Germany, now based in the United States. Working uh, at what? Say it again. Doing what? Well, I finished my PhD earlier this year. I'm now a research fellow at the Wharton School, a research fellow at the University of Birmingham in the UK, and president of iSpace Institute. It's a small research and consulting company that we started during my PhD. The company does what? Well, we're looking at the strategic and entrepreneurial management of knowledge. That's also what we're doing in the research initiative I had at Wharton. Um, so we really think about or try to develop tools for decision makers that help them compete in the knowledge economy. Dangerously fashionable, eh? Well, <laughs> try to be. And um, what is... What, what are you saying, that uh, you need to m m mix up the, um, you need to be entrepreneurial in academic life and then it flashes back into what you can make a business out of? That's well, that would be uh, great. Thing? My, my thing is really to have one foot in academia and one foot in the commercial world. Why? Um, I would like to have the intellectual challenge of academia and the entrepreneurial challenge of the commercial world. But that's difficult because uh, you're neither in academia or in the entrepreneurial world. So an uh, entrepreneur is going to say, well, you're a strange academic. And the academics say, oh, you're not a real scholar, full professor, whatever. Um, so it's tough. But I think if you do meaningful research, see collaborations with companies, you can get there. I'm going to give you a caricature that academic life puts everything in boxes or in files and it's all red and that kind of thing. And there's very little actually encounter with the real world. But the intellectual stimulation of running a business is far more intense than that, far more overwhelming, far more 24 hours a day than that. That you're playing four-dimensional chess when you start a business, you're playing three-dimensional or two-dimensional chess in academic life because you can keep the world at bay. Well, it depends. I think there are such academics and such academics, and uh, the uh, the possibility that academia gives you to really think thoroughly through problems, um, not driven always by uh, where's the profit line, and come up with unique, innovative um, models that finally help business. Um, it's tough to do that in a fast-paced business world. So to have this combination of academia where you're allowed to do crazy stuff and um, the entrepreneurial world where you have to get products or markets um, is a neat one. Alert listeners will have noticed this is a very, very rarefied discussion. Nobody has mentioned money yet at all. <laughs> you started a business right. to fulfill yourself or to make money? Both. Um, I love making money. Uh, <laughs> I'm from confession. an it's true life confession time. Uh, I'm from an entrepreneurial family, so entrepreneurship was always part of my life. But I also, well, doing my academic stuff, uh, came to appreciate um, the fun you can have in academia. Especially, I mean, the the people I work with in the United States, um, they really encouraged me to to stay on, um, encouraged me to do things that I probably wouldn't have been able to do in Europe. Um, and, well, it's not easy, but I really try to, to combine both worlds. Of course, you are a very lucky audience, aren't you? I mean, very, very privileged, this lot. There will be people listening who are saying, if only I had half or a quarter of that intelligence opportunity, all that kind of thing. This is a f world you're looking at full of opportunity. Anyway, where do we go next? Okay, we're going to Lars at the back. Another man we're going to. Lars likes debates, by the way. <laughs> That's true. My name is Lars Diersma, and I'm from Holland. And I'm an entrepreneur. I started a training agency about five years ago, and I basically help people to get their message across. Because I, I see that there's a lot of people with great ideas. I've met many of them here. And now it's time to get their message across. So I help them craft their message, in, in, in whether it's in a business meeting or I prepare politicians for election debates. I, I help them to get their message over. So fluency doesn't necessarily go with ambition or uh, good ideas at the start, entrepreneurial ideas or good social ideas. Um, you need to learn fluency as well, do well, you? Well, what I see with a lot of entrepreneurs, I mean, they have the passion. They uh, often can get their message across, but within, even within organizations, there's a lot of experts uh, that know a lot about something but can't get it across, not even within their own organization. And I help those people to get 
the content to like whether it's their peers or their superiors or others. Yeah. I'm a broadcaster and I've been in this game an awful long time. And when I started off, we used to go to people at the top of businesses who mm -hmm. were almost incoherent. Media training, media yeah. savviness was not part of their world. And they were jolly good businessmen, but they yeah. couldn't express themselves. And it mm -hmm. didn't really matter if they ran sound businesses. But that's changed so radically well, in the I, past I, 30 I, years. I think we do quite the opposite of what, what people usually do during media training. So what, I, what my experience of media training is, is that people learn to say at least as possible using as many words words as possible. And I do the exact opposite. I, I <laughs> teach people to say the most possible using the least words. Uh, turn that into... <laughs> <laughs> I think I better sign up for this immediately after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, turn, that, turn what you've just said into some kind of proposition some kind of address to the proposition we're talking about. What do I do with my life? You can't just say I want to be fluent. Mm -hmm. Fluent about what? No. Fluent to do what? What's well, a good choice? Well, when I look from like the perspective of my generation to the discussion that we, that we just heard is, what, we, what I saw a lot is that people were talking about what the government could possibly do or what businesses could possibly do. What I see in the people around me is that we are not so much interested in that. We are, not, we are more interested in what we ourselves can do. So however pathetically small that effort is, we want to leave our dent in the universe and we'd rather do it ourselves than f have a vivid discussion on what others can do. I'll ask the panel in a minute, but some of the panel would say, you're so naive, you're so enthusiastic, but you haven't had your corners knocked off by the real world. And the real world is where governments still have such an overwhelming power yeah. in what you, the individual, or the entrepreneur, or the business founder can do. Don't even think of doing it unless you can... Uh, uh, get government on your side, so government retains its power. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get that from the audience, no, because they haven't had the corners knocked off them by the real world experience yet. That's yeah. what uh, I think people here will say. Yeah, so what's your point? <laughs> 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 the point is, I think a lot of people with the kind of wonderful ideas that people here have, and I've encountered them outside this hall, uh, are going to be severely disappointed when they start doing the things they say they're going to do. Well, we just learned that failure is very important, so let them fail. <laughs> okay, panel, any... I, any <laughs> Maybe, maybe I was generalizing quite wrongly. I've been unfair to you. Any, any uh, comments on what we've heard so far? I mean, you know, he, he, he's right. Failure is important. But it's not necessary that everybody who starts as an entrepreneur is capable of taking his entrepreneurial business to the next level. Uh, you know, ultimately, all entrepreneurial businesses become corporations or get bought by corporations. So you know, that transition is not necessarily something an entrepreneur is good at. I know a lot of people who start businesses, five years, sell it, and start another business because they don't want to get to that next level of, of actually building an organization, putting in the systems, putting in the processes. But it's when it grows like that that the jobs start flowing absolutely. and the, and the social purpose yeah. of any business, yeah. whether it's set up yeah. for a social purpose or not, really yeah. begins to kick yeah. in. And I think that's the, the, the task of a corporation, which is we, we search around the world, we look for technologies, we look for opportunities, we look for entrepreneurship, we look for businesses and products. And we have the ability to scale it up, mm. something that may not necessarily be there uh, with an entrepreneur. All right? And uh, it's not about resources as much as sometimes it's just speed to market or just getting things done quickly with the kind of resources you can bring to bear. Uh, I just want to go back a little bit to, to you know, Kishore's uh, thing. Some of the finest executives I've met are ministers in the Singapore government. Uh, absolutely superb. I mean, I would hire them outright and, you know, to, to come work for me, no question about it. Uh, but I think what's happening in the world is that I think technology is just making governance very, very difficult. Uh, the speed at which things get innovated around the world is making, difficult, making it very difficult for governments restricted in national boundaries to be able to, to manage this process. So the, the failure of governance that we see, in my opinion, is actually being driven more and more by innovation and technology. So perhaps it is time that government started thinking out of the box and saying, like the Singaporean government, maybe we need to go out, pay top dollar, get the best talent, so that at least we can actually do the governance bit properly. Because today, I just don't think whether you're a small, it's easier in a small country, Finland, Singapore, it's much, much more difficult 
in a large country with a large population. Faisal? Um, I don't think there's anything naive about thinking you can change the world or change the way things are done. It's the only way change happens. Um, so I think a small change multiplied many, many, many times will be a big change. What's really clear um, is that lots of people have had experience of small business, small enterprises, social enterprises and others. And one of the things that, that you've, you've mentioned a couple of times that's really, re really true is that they, they suffer from all the problems that small enterprises suffer from. They have leadership problems, they have structural problems, they have finance problems. But what they don't have, what they don't suffer from, is a lack of opportunity. What they do miss out is a lack of quality of new people coming to join the sector. And the thing that I've seen a lot more over the last year, two years, are every month, every week in fact now, I get 20 to 30 applicants from people who are working in the commercial sector, in big business, saying, I'm kind of bored of what I do. I really am bored. And I'm not so much interested in what I do, I'm interested in why I do it. And I think this is the revolution that I'm talking about. People are interested in doing something useful, something that gives them some purpose. They may not have figured it out, but there are a lot of people trying. And I think the more people who try, and the more people who get engaged, we might start seeing some of the massive systemic changes that we need. Ultimately, enterprise is about problem solving, and social enterprise is about solving social problems. How you cut it, how you do it, whether it's through an NGO, an enterprise, a private business partnership in the way someone like Grameen Bank and Danan have done, or whether it's with a government partnership or some other, is, is totally up to you. But it would be a failure to, to not try, and it would be a failure to think that this is the wrong thing to do. This is the BBC debate. Yeah. Cut off by clapping. This is the BBC debate from the student-run St. Gallen Symposium in northeast Switzerland, debating the question, how do I make a difference with my life? By joining business, becoming a so-called social entrepreneur, etc., etc. Or what? Uh, let's go back to the... Uh... Okay, yeah, yeah. Where are we now? Sorry, I can't see what... Hi, my name is Denis Ruchekov. I come from uh, Estonia, but I study in uh, BI Norwegian School of Management in uh, Norway. And uh, I just wanted to give you, I, I was thinking uh, about what students and young people do really think, just to give you a uh, scientifically unproven uh, field <laughs> research. Um, <laughs> just remember some conversations of what people are concerned about. Hard exams. I have so many hard exams the next week. I can't afford to buy a new jacket. I can't, uh, I can't buy a new iPad because it's still not in Norway. Uh, it's still <laughs> only in the US. What I say uh, to all of them, it's ridiculous. People, it's really ridiculous. You can't uh, complain about what you, what you say because uh, what you really, what, who, you don't have a right to complain. Because who has the right to complain is the person somewhere in Mozambique or in Tajikistan or in, in Cameroon who uh, doesn't have any access to education or uh, doesn't know how to feed his children and his pregnant wife, although he's only 21 and he doesn't have a job. So what, what, I, what I really want to know is, and here we are, we are around 200 global leaders of tomorrow and we, and we belong to what 0.0.1% of the most educated people in the world. What do we, what young people usually say they want? Number one, I want to have fun in my life. I want to travel around the world to live in Argentina, to live in Malaysia, whatever. Number two, I want to have challenge in my life. But I really rarely hear about I have responsibility because I'm privileged. We heard that just before. I am privileged. I really feel I am privileged. I am privileged to be born in a country which doesn't have natural disasters and uh, civil wars. I'm really privileged to have, uh, to have been given this opportunity to get this education that I got. But I don't really know where my contribution is the most critical. And that's the question I would like to ask and to you guys, you the panelists and people who are much smarter than us young people ch to challenge us really. What is the most critical point, the most critical area where our contribution is critically needed in this world? Um, I think one of the most important things you touched upon there is, is the struggle uh, that people in, in the developing world have. 
and comes back to the role of different individuals. And, and, and I talked earlier about uh, the transformation in India and, and China through the entrepreneurship and, and the government stepping back. One of the biggest crimes I think that society is seeing at the moment is actually government caused. And for those of you who are uh, members, uh, citizens of the European Union, the EU with its common agricultural policy, which suppresses the, the, the price of food, and it creates oversupply in Europe and then puts barriers up to countries like Mozambique. That is where government is doing harm. Uh, and you say, what can you do? Well, actually, it's to talk to government representatives and say, stop hurting people in the developing world. It's to step back and get out of the way. I'm actually very glad, Shane, you brought the case of subsidies, you know. And your example is exactly describe what the problem is, right? It's politicians trying to get elected, yep. and therefore they cater to the farm lobbies, they give them subsidies, and they impoverish farmers in Africa. You know, you blame government for that. Let me be a bit more heretical here. Why not blame the populations who vote those politicians? Absolutely. Is the populations who do it. And that's it's why your fault. <laughs> it's very important to change the thinking. And yeah, by the way, the most important thing, most important word that our friend from Estonia used that I'm surprised that we haven't used very much here is the word responsibility. And he's right. Everybody in this room belongs to the top 0.01% of the world's population, easily. You have privileges, you have access to information, money, power, of a kind that 99.9% .9 of the world doesn't have. And if you use that purely to fulfill your own personal needs, make a lot of wealth for yourself, and don't think about the impact on the rest of the world, then that's a problem. But if you can make the top 0.01% of the world's population begin to say, what is my responsibility to the world? Then believe me, just injecting the word responsibility can have a huge difference to the world. I have another Estonian question, and that is what do you want said about you in your obituary? <laughs> Sorry? What do you want people to say about you in your obituary? That's one way of re-asking this question, what do I do with my life? What would you like people to say about you when you're dead? Right, I, I want to say several things. I want, uh, I want them to say that uh, I did, however tiny, but a small contribution that uh, Estonia and my country in 20, 30 years will be uh, economically, politically and socially part of Nordic Europe. And uh, it will be uh, a, a recognized uh, world uh, in, in the world where I say, when I'm say, saying that I'm from Estonia, that I get a proving note and not a question mark in the eyes of people, <laughs> like I usually do. So that's my dream. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I really want to do a small, uh, however tiny, revolution in higher education where I want to contribute. I want to be a teacher at the university and to motivate people to do great things uh, with their lives, to get out of the box that they have been put into by their families and, and societies and so on. And so that many, many students of mine would come to my funerals. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there are people who really want to uh, say something or ask a question who, uh, you know, sort of, yes, there's somebody right at the back. Can we get a microphone right up there to... I can see a pair of spectacles and a white hand up there. But uh, uh, say who you are and uh, sort of why you're making this point, please. Um, hi, my name is Rajan Makijani. I am from India and uh, recently settled in Singapore. Uh, my question is, we've discussed uh, large corporates, we've discussed business, um, oh, sorry, uh, social entrepreneurship uh, and so on. I was wondering whatever happened to creative arts as a career? Is um, arts out of fashion? 
I don't think it was a choice we gave people, actually. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> intrude it in. Are you making a pitch for uh, the creative artist changing the world through a vision of the world, or, or what? Yeah, I was just reflecting on this very important forum, um, not even having that in its consideration set. What does it tell us? I think it's because we've got this big word entrepreneurship blasted all over the screens that uh, <laughs> um, somehow an artist doesn't seem very entrepreneurial. And, uh, oh, absolutely not. No, of course no. that's wrong. No. <laughs> Confession. <laughs> because artists change the world more powerfully than most business leaders do, or some artists do that. We know that. Um, any any uh, comment on that? Or Yeah. Say who you are. Uh, yeah, uh, Angad Paul, I, I was uh, talking to you earlier. Um, <laughs> um, uh, just to say, in terms of, of the creative arts, um, in a lot of ways, in terms of um, entrepreneurship, and I know that Simone, uh, Simone de Puri is, is going to be uh, joining this forum, um, you know, someone like Damien Hurst, in terms of value addition, is probably one of the most incredible artists, uh, I'm sorry, incredible entrepreneurs mm. of recent times. Um, you have people like Jeff Koons, you had Mark Kostabi that never even did any of his works and uh, sold it in the 80s. Um, you know, it's really how you look at what constitutes um, um, entrepren entrepreneurial um, capability or ability. One of the things is that um, what I was trying to say earlier is there's a balancing act that needs to be placed because you hit a point where things just don't make sense anymore. So the art market got hit because things just weren't making sense anymore. And um, I, think, uh, I think it's important to consider that there is entrepreneurship everywhere, but I think um, the creative arts as a profession should be viewed for its creation and the entrepreneurship in it is the byproduct. But you mention Damien Hirst, who yeah. uh, uh, manners, manu for the young British artist who manufactures money out of his art in a, in a huge way. And there is an elephant in this hall, and that elephant is money. Is the assumption that we blithely, luxuriously talk about career choices and that kind of thing, um, and reward and that kind of thing, because we are leaving the ugly necessity of earning a living out of the equation we talk about. Is it the assumption of so many people in this room that whatever you do, you're going to be well off and not challenged from the, the financial point of view, and therefore you have this great luxury of, of other choices? Is, is that what's going on here? Any hands up? Right yeah, yes. Yes, one of our ordinary age members here. <laughs> you are. Well, I'm only 83, <laughs> and I'm very, very clear. That, that does our averaging rather, yeah, rather well, right. that does, yes. Uh, and I have a very clear plan of what I want to do with my life. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> And one of the reasons why I can have this very clear plan, because I'm in the age where I don't have to, uh, let's say, I, I live on pension, I don't have to earn money. Now, uh, what I want to do is to improve the governance of my native country, which happens to be Ukraine, because the governance now is lousy. And I try to help it, actually, with some advice, because I happen to know about 70 countries and different economic systems, different political systems, including Singapore very well. Uh, but I have not been able to do it through, by giving advice to the presidents, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm now doing, and that's my plan, is precisely how to help emerge a critical mass of an elite. We don't have an elite now in governance. We have people that fill their pockets, or defend their particular interests. And, but there is a new generation emerging. They know the world better. They know the languages. They have networks. They are <coughs> you know, graduates of, let's say, alumni of institutions like ISEC, 
like youth parliament of uh, U Ukrainian youth, parl Euro youth parliament. They study legislation of different countries, etc. So th you see, all my plan is to use whatever means I have. And if you have a good mission in mind, the means always come, by the way. The means always come is to help th these networks create, say, new parties, take over the government in, say, 10 years from now. That's my plan. You found a hole in the socio-political marketplace. You're a social entrepreneur, a socio-political entrepreneur. <laughs> of sort. No, no, I'm an institutional entrepreneur because I've created a lot of institutions. Thank you. And you can still think like that at the age of 83. <laughs> well, and that's the reason why I actually have been fairly closely associated with this uh, uh, event, with uh, uh, the St. Gallen Symposium, because I've had an early lesson that if you listen clearly, uh, uh, to young people who are activists, particularly students who are activists, this is the best way of predicting what their country's future will be. I've learned that back in Dakar in 1952 at the World Assembly of Youth. Uh, Africa was still a series of colonies, but people from, say, uh, French colonies or British colonies were saying once inside the hall in Dakar, we want our countries to become independent in 52. And then I tried to give lectures about it, that all these countries would become independent in a generation. I was wrong. They became independent in a decade. So change can happen. Exactly. It will happen. Peter. Peter, thank you. Peter. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the, there's another invisible elephant in this room, and that's political correctness. The political correctness <laughs> assumption is that most of humanity lives in well-ordered societies, and therefore you need to tinker a bit here and there, and you can fix everything. And I'm glad you used the word corruption. And if you want to understand why many people are suffering, especially people at the very bottom in most societies, it's because of corruption. And if you want to help people at the very bottom, the one thing you can do is to find a way to fix corruption. And that's not easy. That's why you need good governance. And you know, someone mentioned artists, okay? Yeah, I'm going to say something very politically incorrect. We admire what Bono has done in Africa. He wants to help Africa. He wants to save Africa. He goes down there, highly publicized trips. He goes home. And what's the difference after four to five years? Does anything fundamental change? No. So if you want to help Africa, if you want to help the people at the bottom in Africa, you've got to find a way of improving the governance in Africa. And if you can improve the governance in Africa, the, the human good that you do for people at the very bottom is phenomenal. And that's why, let's not focus our attention on the one billion people who may live in relatively well-ordered societies, developed societies, but on the remaining 5.8 billion people who live in various imperfect societies. And for them, a small improvement, believe me, a small improvement in the level of governance makes a huge difference in the quality of their lives. And let's focus on what we can do for those at the bottom also. That's Professor Kishore Mabubani from Singapore. Let's go to the rest of the, the panel just for brief summing up on uh, what we've heard over the last hour. Uh, Sean Frith. Uh, I'd agree with the professor uh, about improvement in government, uh, uh, governance, uh, but I view an improvement in governance is less government, and the way that you're going to improve Africa, as an example, is to allow an entrepreneur, be it a, a small startup entrepreneur or a large multinational that wants to move a, a paper factory into, into an African country that's going to start an export industry that is going to start a, a business that is going to provide real jobs. The, the Band-Aid solution, no pun intended, of, of, of Bono and the artists won't make real change. 
the real change will come from people such as in this audience who will start up businesses that will create real wealth in these countries. I got your name wrong, didn't I? It's all, it always gets named. <laughs> Shane Frith. Yes, Shane. <laughs> Gautam Tapa. I think if you're like that, the young man from Ukraine and recognize that the education you get here <laughs> is a privilege Still and you're aware of that privilege, uh, that privilege open door, opens doors. This education opens doors. So, frankly, it doesn't matter really what you end up doing. You will make an impact in society in your own way because... You have the choice, which a lot of people, the 5.8 billion that Kishore talked about, or even less than that, don't have. The power of a good education, the power to open doors, and the power to do different things. Most of them don't suffer or actually suffer from a lack of opportunity. Forget about a lack of power. Faisal yeah. Rahman. Um, whether you're from Ukraine, Estonia, England, or anywhere else, um, being an entrepreneur is unbelievably hard. Very few of you probably will. Actually, the quality here is very high, but generally, very few people can or will be. And the only advice or the only suggestion I can give anyone is to, is to go where others aren't. Go where others aren't doing anything, whether that's in Africa, whether that's in your own street, in your own community, or in a new area. Ukraine. Go where other people aren't doing anything. And if you go there, you can maybe create something that other people aren't creating. I was told that... Um, somebody once totaled the amount of money that was invested into developing the jet engine and calculated the amount of money that was made out of the creator of the jet engine and it kind of balanced at zero. There are a lot of failures to be made still and there are still a lot of successes to be done. What's clear is that nobody's quite figured it out yet. So if you have a vision of what you think the world should look like, you should go there and you should do it. Thank you to everyone here at the St. Gallen Symposium. <laughs> this has been... Whose business is it? A BBC global debate. Perhaps it's given you insights in what you ought to do with your life. Perhaps it's shed light on the ideas you ought to have had or the paths you ought to have taken. Rather sad, that. This is an exciting time of change. People can make a great big difference to the way the world works and is going to work, in business and out of it. Good luck with your choices. Thank <laughs> you.